this is uh, uh, one of the main uh, uh, topics of today that is connected also to another word that is populism how and uh, how much populism uh, is rooted in religious uh, tensions in religious roots uh, do does uh, populism exploit religions or vice versa religions uh, uses uh, populism to find new rooms in public spheres there are a lot of questions and uh, for the reason i thank uh, uh, all uh, the speakers of uh, today afternoon. I thank uh, all the participants to this seminar. So I invite you after uh, their intervention to intervene with question or in the chat or directly. And uh, I thank again uh, uh, Jonathan Lawrence, Professor Lawrence, uh, for having accepting to, to be uh, with us. And I give the floor to you. Thanks again, uh, Jonathan. Uh, thank you very much, Alessandro, and good day to all. It's it's a pleasure uh, to be here uh, to to speak about uh, this important topic with such uh, esteemed colleagues. Uh, as Alessandro mentioned, the the topic of the session is religion and populism in the two Mediterranean shores in the crisis of representative democracy, and I think that's really critical to realize what sort of commonalities our political dynamics are experiencing now. I think that um, Alessandro is right to point to the challenges faced by political Islam, uh, even after it emerged from exile or from, uh, from the background. Um, but the issues that it's raised, the Brotherhood has raised in its various contexts have not um, gone away. Uh, and indeed, governments in Muslim majority countries across the world um, need to think hard about the uh, policy uh, agenda that parties like the Brotherhood put forth because of a larger pressure that is very real, uh, having to do with fundamentalists in the world who are uh, gaining strength and who do profit from times of crisis. Uh, and so if we think about the dialectic between, um, between attempts to make one's polity more reflective of, of one's cultural or religious background, it's a dialectic that takes place in a sense, and this is dangerous waters, but in a sense with the very extremists that one is hoping to ward off with the very policies. And I would argue that something similar is going on in Western Europe, um, especially if you look at the way that centrist or center-right parties are forced into a sort of dialectic with their own extremes, uh, with the extreme right that is asking, of course, a different set of questions than the Muslim Brotherhood, but which also gets at the core question that, uh, that each nation state essentially asks itself which is who are we and how, uh, how much of our nationalist or religious background should we foreground in our political system and how exclusionary does that risk be? So I believe that these, these tendencies of dynamic between populist forces and governing forces is experiencing a peak right now, precisely because they benefit from times of crisis, such as we have been living in. With that uh, introduction, I'm very pleased to host, uh, to, to, to introduce uh, our, our three speakers uh, on today's panel. Um, perhaps what I will do is introduce them in their turn of speaking. And so I uh, will first introduce, uh, well, to announce the three speakers at first, however, we have Professor Michele Sorice from Luis University, uh, Professor Michele Brignone from the Catholic University Milan, and Professor Lahwari Adi from the Université de Lyon Sciences Po. Uh, but to give a full introduction first to our first speaker, please let me introduce uh, Michele Sorice, who is a full professor of democratic innovation, of political sociology, and of media studies 
at the Luis University in Rome, where he is also director of the Center for Conflict and Participation Studies. He is a member of the scientific board of the journalism school, where he also teaches political communication, and he represents Luis with the European Consortium for Political Research. Uh, he has recently published a book on the sociology of media, a critical introduction uh, with Carocci in Rome. Uh, last year, he published a volume on, uh, on democratic participation, theories and problems with Mondadori in Milan, and he is the author of numerous other volumes, both authored, edited, and of course, dozens of articles. Uh, so it is our pleasure and honor to uh, hear from you now, Professor Sorice. Thank you. Thank you very much also for the presentation. It's an honor for me uh, and also a responsibility to start this uh, very interesting panel. I want also to thank uh, the, the organizer for inviting me. And uh, it's really a pleasure to, to try to discuss with you about this very, in my opinion, important topics also for, for our democratic society. I, um, I try to, to share my screen because I want to, to show a short PowerPoint. Yes, I think it works. And um, when, when the organizers um, in, invited me tell, telling also the, the, the topic of my, of my short speech, of course, uh, I, I, I will try to, to not begin and to speak shortly anyway. Uh, the, the, the topic was uh, so uh, important and so dangerous in all its aspects populisms, the politicization and transformation of democracy. At the point that I, I thought, oh, okay, I have to, to, to speak about uh, uh, but of course uh, it's not possible. And for this reason, I will try to, to cut my, my presentation in a, in a sort of different panels and different frames in which I want to, to try to uh, to put together these topics that uh, concern my presentation. So this is my session agenda today, um, a short session, of course. The first point, where we are, uh, that means uh, try, I, I will try to, to give from my perspective uh, the, the, the basic concept that, that usually I have to consider when when we study when we make research on this topic uh, there are uh, in particular four sub points the mutation of democracy the so-called crisis of representation because it's doubtful if we have to speak about a real crisis of representation of a perceived crisis of representation the digital ecosystem and its role in the process of platformization and uh, the emergence of a post-representative politics in what uh, we have started to call post policy The second point will be a very short analysis on the depoliticization and its relationship with the, the emergence and mm, persistence of neoliberalism. And uh, uh, at the end, I will, I will speak about populism, but only in a very uh, open way uh, 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 with a purpose to, uh, to give something more to the to debate and, non, and surely not to conclude this argument. So let, let's go immediately to the first, where we are now. Uh, the first point is crisis of democracy. Uh, it's really, is it really a crisis of democracy or a perceived crisis of democracy? Uh, usually when we speak about uh, crisis of democracy and crisis of representation, where we use in particular in the journalistic language to overlap these uh, two dimensions, the, these two trends. But I want to be a bit more precise in, on this point because 
politics and democracy are two different topics. And in many cases, representation is the background for democracy, but it's not necessary for democracy. And the point that in the Federalist Papers, uh, in Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson and, and the other constitutionalist uh, uh, American um, used a lot of times the concept of representation and the concept of free vote and the possibility to give the chance to all the people to, cho to choose their, their representatives, but they have really in disgust the democracy. Uh, it, it was absolutely present, uh, this, con this contradiction between representation and democracy. Uh, so when we speak about the crisis of democracy, probably uh, it will be better to refer to the crisis of representation and in particular to a crisis that involves a lot of different uh, actors. So for example, we speak about the so-called populist parties. Um, usually their first point is trying to delegitimize the presentation because it is considered exhausted facing to the opportunities offered by the so-called bottom-up participation. And for this reason, in many cases, the populist appeal overlaps with a, re with a request for a, a stronger uh, participation, at least theoretically, and at the same time with the refusal of the democratic institution Democratic uh, Institute for, um, for the use of representative methods. Uh, in reality, uh, to, uh, to the problem with the representation are uh, based upon another modern trend that is the transformation of democracy. In 2003, Colin Crouch uh, made a very interesting analysis of the mutation, the anti-egalitarian democracy, as, as he, he spoke in that time. Uh, to uh, Colin Crouch is a sociologist and a political scientist. According to uh, Colin Crouch, liberal democracy that is usually based upon the growing intervention of the state in the market, the parties based democracy, and the sovereignty of the states is put in crisis by the emergence of new trends that are based upon the neoliberal trend toward a, a great uh, um, insurgence of, uh, of liberalization of markets and with a, with a transformation that refer to many aspects of social life. So according to Colin Crouch in 2003, uh, the shifting from the state to the market, from the centrality of the state to the centrality of the market, from the representative institutions to the executives, and in particular with the insurgents of technocracies, and from the nation state, the governmental national organization and the supranational organizations were responsible for two different, different outputs. From one side, the crisis of participation in democratic institutions. From the other side, a major request for a stronger participation from the below. Uh, that is in many cases uh, uh, what the populist parties and populist leaders and populist movements uh, demand to social, uh, uh, to social uh, um, action. Uh, he wrote these things in 2003. Um, it was accused, he was accused to be a bit pessimistic. Uh, after 17 years, uh, he has published another book uh, that, is, that, uh, that is based upon the same topic, but in the frame of crisis. And in the preface, Colin Crouch wrote, uh, yes, probably I, I, I made some fault in my first book in 2003 about this topic. Uh, but not because I was too pessimistic, but because probably I was too optimistic. Because the situation now, even with the COVID-19, and in particular with the resurgence of neoliberal approach 
to society and democracy is even more dramatic. Anyway, um, I don't want uh, to be too long on this point. Uh, key concept of the post-democracy according to Colin Crouch, the change in the relationship between liberalism and democracy, the professionalization of politics that is evident in the media, in particular with all the spin -off, uh, spin -doctor, sorry, in the political communication, the companies as an institutional excellence, and it is evident also in the rhetoric concerning the state that is wake and should be in many discourses lightweight instead of uh, a, a strong state to preserve democracy. And the fourth point, the commodification of citizenship, that is another very important point in Colin Crouch's analysis. Uh, briefly, there's this point, relationship between liberalism and democracy. Uh, according to Colin Crouch, the tendency to equality that is typical of democracy and the opportunities that are typical of the Adam Smith vision of liberalism tend to conflict in many cases to the benefit of the latter and the first, um, the benefit for the liberal opportunities. Uh, it means the loss of centrality of the welfare state and a changing role of political parties, in many cases discredited and uh, also with a very uh, evident loss of credibility in uh, social life. Professionalization of politics, that is another important change and transformation, the rising of leaders legitimated by media, that is very evident in the populist parties, and the transformation, the shifting from activists and sympathizers protagonism to the centrality of opinion polls, and again, in the frame of the media. The other two points expressed by Colin Crouch companies as model for institutional excellence. Uh, it, it means a very loss of credibility of politics and trust in government that is evident in some technocratic uh, trends and the rhetoric on the incompetence of the state that is very present, for example, in Italy. Uh, it, it's not new because uh, at the beginning of Berlusconi era in 1994, the idea of the incompetence of the state and also of the parliament was very strong and was one of the key points of Silvio Berlusconi's storytelling about politics. And the neoliberal market that is going in an anti-liberal loop because it tends to push and crush the small companies uh, affirming the power of great uh, majors across the world, few majors across the world. And and um, only last but not least point, commodification of citizenship. That means that the market become uh, uh, the final purpose of the civil society and not only a tool to improve, if possible, civil society. So the first, the, uh, a first consequence of commodification of the common goods is the transformation of uh, some rhetoric concerning the state and politics. So the rhetoric of efficiency of the state, the rhetoric of the private that, that is considered always better than public and the rising of new forms of political parties that have been excluding or marginalizing the traditional mass political party uh, uh, that, 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 that were the, the basic point of the of the origin of the democratic uh, development after the Second World War. Uh, second uh, sub point, uh, uh, sorry, third uh, sub point of the, this first part uh, where we are. We are a digital system that is also responsible for the insurgence of the so called platform society. Uh, this is very evident uh, in this table. This table is, um, comes from a, a, a book of Jan van Dijk uh, that is uh, titled Network Society, um, in, in which is it's evident the shifting from the mass society based upon the broadcasting, for example, in the media and the traditional uh, mass party from the other side and the new public spaces, uh, we can call the network society where we live now, in which we have a lot of public spaces, a lot of uh, different and overlap political and public spaces, and the insurgence of 
global, national and local public spaces that are interrelated and in many cases uh, also overlapped. And this differentiation is at the very background for the uh, evolution, for the insur insurgence of what uh, three Martin de Waal called the platform society. That is a society in which not only the media, not only the digital ecosystems, but all the communication system is responsible for the creation of a new environment. In this way, uh, according to these Dutch scholars, platforms do not reflect the social because they produce the social structures in which we live. This is very important because it's a change of perspective. Also in the analysis that usually we uh, social science scholars uh, uh, um, have, may, have been made, making for many years and in particular during the last uh, 20 years. So uh, we are living now in crisis times and this expression crisis times or times of crisis uh, it is again not new and it's not connected with the COVID-19 pandemic experience because uh, it has been theorized by many scholars before the insurgence of the pandemic. Uh, so in particular, we can uh, um, highlight some um, factors that are very important and that in a certain way define the transformation that we are living in. The awakening of institutions that, that are also an output of the, of the crisis of the representations, the development of risk policies that are uh, usually proposed and organized by governments across the world, the ideological fragmentation of political parties that are always uh, weak, weaker in, in their capacity to to propose policy making and to activate policy making, the resurgence of nationalisms and identity politics that are two different trends, but in many cases connected and framed very often in populistic appeals, the instability of the new parties and movements that are uh, new experiences that in many cases uh, uh, have been lasting for few years. Uh, and it is, this is evident not only for populist parties, but also for many new experiences of, of parties also in, in, uh, in the uh, progressive area. Uh, the information overload and the problem of the truth of information, that is one of the problems that uh, we are facing too in, in the last years. Think about the Cambridge Analytica scandal, for example, or the the, the so-called concept of the filter bubbles. And again, all the problems concerning the fake in political communication that, are, that have been very important also in the last uh, um, presidential election in the US. Uh, the uncontrollable news and information flows in social media that is strongly connected with the, with the previous point. The uh, insurgence of fragmented and polarized audiences that are evident in this network society in which we have the opportunity to live in specific, uh, specific bubbles and at the same time to, um, to create some regime of truth that are contrasting to, 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 to the idea of, a, of the truth of, as an ontological measure uh, and uh, it's not uh, it's not for, for chance, uh, I, I, I won't open here uh, two brackets. Um, um, it's not for, for, for chance that uh, many, many social scientists uh, have re, uh, ref, uh, refined, refined the, the, the lesson coming from Anna Harent uh, uh, um, on, the, on the difference and the uh, contrast between politics and truth that is very, very typical of this time, not only of the Anarans time. And last point, the crisis a paradigm that has been explained very well by Aaron Davis in 2019 and before the COVID-19 
pandemic crisis, uh, all these elements uh, uh, can can give us the opportunity to to say that we live in another public sphere that is difficult to define. And for this reason, some some of us, in particular, my colleague Philip Schlesinger of University of Glasgow, <coughs> and also myself, we have tried to to use another term, another expression that is post-public sphere, that is uh, an expression that, that have no, no meaning, but at the same time is the only possibility to define a public sphere, a public sphere that is no longer that of the past and that is uh, not really realized and, and uh, uh, comprehensible at this point. Uh, but most important thing, we are living in the post-public sphere that is also uh, a new world in which we uh, can clearly distinguish the, the transformation for the representative politics of the past in a new past representative politics. This figure comes from uh, an analysis of John Keane, uh, published in 2013, and uh, you, you, you can see this, uh, this figure is a uh, is uh, uh, it, it can appear difficult, but it's very easy. Uh, at the center, there is a, a strange figure that uh, it looks like uh, the, the the communicator of Star Trek uh, for the for the lovers of of science fiction, uh, in, in which anyway there is the traditional links between citizens, parties, election, the representatives, so the elected, and the executives in a vertical organization. Now we have a lot of connections in which these relationships still exist, but in a new frame in which we have a, a, a network that uh, put together the, the new media and the old media, the communicative ecosystem as a whole, the government watchdogs, and also the state borders that are again important to understand also in a globalized world what is what is happening uh, in uh, in in uh, modern society? You have around five minutes with, uh, left. Sorry, five minutes left, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I I get to. Uh, we have now uh, the the another concept that is probably useful for our purposes that has that is the concept of a hyper-representation, the, the emergence of, of hyper-representation is very evident in the populist parties and in populist movements that are two different things. And the hyper-representation is a sort of legitimacy of the authoritarian leaderism. Uh, I want to underline the difference between the hyper-representation that is based upon the existence and the insurgence of hyper and the protest the anti-global protest, 99% is not 100%. The populist appeal is based upon the existence, the existence of 100% that is we, us, against the other, the them that are, of course, the 0% because they don't exist. So, um, uh, I, okay, this is only, uh, I go to the conclusion, speaking about depoliticization. What is the depoliticization? Uh, Probably we can define it as the reducing politics to dimension with, with a substantial marginalization, both of ideological conflict and of the polity as a project community. You know that in political science, usually we subdivide politics and politics as strategic activity, policy uh, as the capacity to create uh, specific measures for organizing society and the polity as a community of destiny and project. Um, in in the depoliticization, policy become most important, the most important thing, and that there is a marginalization of the other two. two. Um, the politicization is also connected with the emergence of so-called anti-politics. It is very evident in uh, in uh, populist parties and movements, and uh, uh, it is very important to understand how this tendency to the post politics is strongly connected with the neoliberalism approach that is based upon the centrality of the economic dimension in spite 
of the old centrality of the political dimension. That may mean the decline politics, as we can see in this table, that is only a, a, a very easy a, a, an introduction to, to, this, uh, to this topic. Um, but very important topic and really uh, uh, going to conclude the different, the, the, the shifting from government to governance that is typical of the depoliticization process. And in particular in this, uh, um, in this, trend, in this trend, the post politics became a specific space depoliticization and it also connected with some other uh, general trends, the globalization, the neoliberal trends, are, as I said, and the new public management, management, it is a way in which public administration can be organized and also private organization. Uh, Populism at this point is only a consequence of all these trends. So here we are, and populism is only an outcome of this tendency. And I want to remind that populism and neoliberalism has a common history, even if these sometimes appear difficult to accept, they have also the same uh, strong uh, slogans, such as, for example, the centrality of popular skills in the, in the case of populisms and the tactical that, they, that are practical, like the popular skills for the neoliberalism, uh, the efficiency that means for, uh, for the populist, for example, no need for political parties. And the, that is in neoliberal approach, no need for parliamentary procedures that are too slow, that are perceived are too slow in favor of the emergence of a lightweight state. So um, I, I want only, uh, sorry, I, I, I take one minute to only to explain that I use, I use neo-communitarianism and technocracy in two specific uh, meaning. Uh, so the egalitarian communitarianism, which has its origin in the conciliarism, that is a, 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 a Christian philosophy of the Middle Age, different from the protective and plebiscitary communitarianism that is typical of populist parties and movements. At the same time, technocracy is based upon a lot of a sort of politicization of technocracy that are the determinants at the same time of the process of depoliticization of liberal democracy. So politicized technology to depoliticize society. This, this could be the slogan to understand what happens uh, in uh, this, uh, in this uh, uh, space. Uh, what I said before, and uh, um, uh, and sorry, uh, a, a summary that I can I can send you if you if you want if you need. So uh, my my task is uh, now over. Uh, I I will not speak about populism and religion because I'm not a specialist of this topic, but I only want to uh, remind you that there is a strong connection between the religious populism populism and the insurgence of depoliticized processes in many aspects of our social and political life. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sorice. That was uh, a, a brilliant um, uh, tour of the horizon of the, the many complex uh, systems and, and mechanisms. And I think it's a really fascinating way to think about where we are situated in this social, political, economic moment. Um, I'd like to take 10 minutes or so to uh, invite questions from uh, the, the fellow panelists or, and the audience as well. But I would, I would start with one question of my own, um, which, which has to do actually with your, your last point about neo-communitarianism and, and technos technocracy and how it relates to your earlier uh, points about the crisis of, of representation. Because what I uh, heard, I believe, or detected in 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 your uh, account, uh, reminded me somewhat of the late uh, 19th century, early 20th century uh, corporatist uh, theorists 
who uh, were thinking about uh, the, the disruptions underway in the new economy then uh, and how to manage the political threats to democracy at a time when parliaments were underperforming, uh, the electorate was quite small, et cetera. Um, well, we, we, we know what came of that in, in a sense that um, the, 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 the bodies in, within the body politic um, uh, hardened into, into, into blocks, which then became very hard to, um, to think of as a unified whole. And I believe that to a certain extent, fascism can be traced to that, um, to these origins. Um, I, I just would love to hear your thoughts on, on that before we, we turn to the, uh, the other questions. Oh, also, I'm, I'm unsure as to how to receive the other questions. Um, will they be pushed into our chat or is there a way for me to, to call on people? Well, while we're waiting for that answer, would you like to um, take a minute to respond to the first question? Can you hear me? Yes, sorry, sorry. Oh. I, uh, I, I have lost your voice for, uh, for some minutes uh, and uh, it was terrible. I, I don't know what. What you said before, I have to read uh, if there are questions in the chat, but I don't, I don't know oh, anything. Did you I, I hear my? Can't. Did you hear my question, or you did not hear my question? Oh, sorry, I, I, I have started to to understand the beginning of your of your discourse discourse about uh, representations. Uh, then, then I have lost your voice. Okay. So, I've lost the central part of your discussion. I'm sorry. That's okay. I, I just wondered whether there was a relation to, between what you were portraying and uh, the situation of, of corporatist theorists at the turn of the last century uh, who, who were thinking about uh, the weaknesses of parliamentary representation at the time and solutions for a dislocated economy and uh, an unstable body politic. Oh yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I did. I, I didn't have before. Yes, I think that uh, there are some differences anyway um, between the corporatist positions uh, of, such as, for example, the fascist positions uh, in the twenties and thirties of the ninth of the last century in in Italy, and the new emergence of populism and nationalism positions. Uh, they have something in common, that is the refusal of the slow of parliament, parliamentary procedures. Um, and, and in common, they have also the, uh, the denounce of the weakness of uh, democratic procedures. But we have now some, uh, some new things that, you know, so for example, uh, in, uh, in the case of the of the new populist movement, uh, uh, they don't refer to the parliament as something to exclude or to avoid, but as something uh, to make more efficient using uh, uh, new tools, such as, for example, electronic tools from one side on from the other side to refer to uh, leaders that can be very popular and democratically elected. Um, so um, I think that uh, probably from economic, from the economic perspective, there are some commonality uh, between corporatist uh, movement of the last century and some anti-global positions, uh, even if uh, it can appear strange. But from political position, from political perspective, I, I think that um, the corporatist positions are more closer to, um, uh, to new totalitarian and not the, to the populist uh, uh, leaders and populist, uh, populist movements, 
that are based upon some other points. Uh, in particular, they use a rhetoric style. I, I don't think, for example, that, that uh, uh, an ideology, a populist ideology really exists. I think that exists a, a, a rhetoric, a populist style that is typical of some movements, but probably we have to refer to these movements, uh, uh, trying to define them in a more, more so um, to, to, be, to be more precise. Um, when I refer to some populist movement, I prefer to speak of, uh, of them uh, considering as uh, um, uh, nationalist or xenophobic or fascist, but not necessarily populist because they use some populist rhetoric and tools, but uh, they are very different from this perspective. For this reason, I don't, I, I think that there are some commonalities between uh, um, some positions of the last century and the new populism, but at the same time, they are different in their political actions. Thank you uh, very much. Um, we have time for another question. If anyone would like to raise it now, we will also hopefully have a few minutes at the end uh, to have common discussion. Um, but uh, I think at this point, we can turn to our next panelist, who is uh, Michele Brignone. Uh, Michele Brignone is, among other things, the scientific secretary of the Oasis International Foundation, and he is the managing editor of its journal. He holds a PhD in history, institutions, and international relations of extra-European countries from the University of Pisa. Since 2010, he has been a professor of Arabic language at the Catholic University of Milan, and his research interests focus on modern and contemporary Islamic political thought and intellectual history. I am looking very much forward to hearing what uh, you have to say, Dr. Brignone, and uh, the floor is now yours. Thank you, thank you, Professor Lawrence. And uh, I would like to thank the organizers for their invitation and for this opportunity. As I will focus on the religious dimension of the, this crisis of democracy, uh, but I will do this tackling the international perspective, because of course, a key characteristic a key characteristic of populism is the mobilization of uh, religion uh, as a resource, a powerful resource for uh, mobilizing people uh, around the idea of a common identity. And this holds true for the, of course, for the domestic dimension, but uh, it can hold true as well for the international level. Uh, as early as the mid 90s, uh, Huntington famously uh, observed that uh, the Westphalian separation of religion and international uh, politics, international relations, uh, was coming to an end because of the role played by world religions and because of religions were starting to intrude into international affairs. I think that this is all the more so in as far as Islam is concerned on account of, of its universal claim, of its universal nature, and because of its capability of mobilizing people throughout the world. So uh, in this respect, I would like to focus on this mobilization capability of Islam by focusing on two rival models. And I'm referring to um, Turkey on the one hand and the United Arab Emirates on the other hand. To be sure, resorting to Islam is a very common feature uh, among Muslim majority countries and they use Islam as a political tool in very different uh, ways. 
and according to different models. But uh, the, reason, the reason why I chose Turkey and the uh, United Arab Emirates is because they represent two diametrically opposed uh, models and they somehow epitomize the extremes of a wide range of uh, possible usages of Islam. So the first model, the Turkish model, consists of the systematic usage of Islam and of Islamic identity as a way of mobilizing people around traditional uh, uh, Islamic, or we could say Islamist claims, like the Muslim solidarity, so the, the solidarity of the Muslim Ummah, uh, the defense of this Ummah from, uh, from external influences, the defense of Palestinian people, for example, and so on. The second model, model the model represented by uh, the United Arab Emirates, uh, stresses the need to integrate into the Western model and to, uh, to allow peaceful coexistence between uh, the Muslim world and the West. But before addressing this, the, the major characteristics of these two paradigms, I, uh, I would like to dwell very briefly on the history of these two countries and the history of their relationship with Islam, because quite interestingly, the two countries not only have different um, trajectories as far as this topic is concerned, but they have radically modified the, their course of action uh, over the last decades. Because up, as we know, up to the 90s, Turkey was very much committed to the Western world. Uh, religions was not separated from the state like in the French model of laicite, but the, st the state controlled religion at a domestic at, and both at a domestic and at a transnational level in order to avoid the emergence of political, potential political challengers from the uh, domestic conservative landscape. The Kemalist elite that ruled the country had a deep desire to be part of the West, of the Western world. Everything changed in, with the new millennium in the years 2000, when uh, the AKP uh, party and Erdogan um, uh, arrived to power. Indeed, from 2002 until 2011, uh, Erdogan's party adopted a quite moderate uh, pro-Western and pro-European stance, presenting itself as a con moderate conservative party. Uh, and in this, in this context, some observers even started to, to talk about a post-secular Turkey, where, uh, that is to say, a country where secular and religious actors could participate on an equal footing to the public debate. And in 2005, Erdogan even launched the, um, with, with, the prime, with then Prime Minister, uh, Spanish Prime Minister Zapatero, the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations after the shock caused by uh, September 11. But Erdogan's stance began to change radically starting in 2011 as a consequence of the eruption of the Arab Spring. Because in this historical context, the Turkish Prime Minister perceived the opportunity to boost Turkish uh, ge geopolitical role in North Africa and in the, in the Middle East. And from this moment, Erdogan started to frame his political 
um, action in Islamic terms, referring, for example, to the Ottoman past of the country and leveraging the uh, ideology, ideological affinity of like-minded parties uh, throughout the Arab world to gain uh, geopolitical projection. So we can say that from this moment on, Erdogan transformed Turkey in what uh, Christopher Cocker called a civilizational state, is to say a state uh, claiming to represent an entire civilization. On the other hand, we have the United Arab Emirates that did not have a precise religious uh, policy, but they espoused traditional Islamic uh, causes, Arab and pan-Islamic causes, like par excellence, the Palestinian one. And furthermore, like other Gulf countries, the UAE became home to those Islamists uh, who sought refuge from the repression they experienced in uh, their home country, especially in Egypt and Syria. In this case, things started to change in the 90s when the Emirati leadership started to perceive the Islamist presence as a threat. And in 2001, when uh, two Emirati nationals were involved in the September 11 attacks, the Emirati leadership uh, completely changed its stance toward Islamism. And even more so after 2011 in the framework of the uh, Arab Spring. So the United, more and more, the United Arab Emirates started to perceive the Islamist rise to power in different Arab countries as an existential threat to their stability. And they um, started to promote very actively an alternative model centered on um, the buzzword, we could say, of um, tolerance and moderate Islam. So meanwhile, they shaped what we can define a new state doctrine, which is, in my opinion, best captured by an article published some months ago by a prominent Emirati political scientist, and I quote, according to this um, political scientist called uh, Abdul Khaleq Abdullah, the Emirati leadership believes in science and listen to scientists. Emirati have taken their leave from demagogic and ideological discourses and given priority to the economy, to development, knowledge, and have invested in infrastructure. So we have a new discourse, completely new discourse, that we can label a neo-positivist and technocratic discourse that goes hand in hand with the systematic cooperation with the West. So this new discourse and this new, this new stance is accompanied by a new uh, religious rhetoric, which is centered on three main aspects. The first one is countering religious extremism, both in its jihadi uh, version and in what some, some scholars call the moderate Islamist uh, discourse represented by Muslim Brotherhood, for example. The second pillar of the Emirati religious discourse is promoting dialogue and tolerance. And the third one is legitimizing not just the Emirati policies, but the Emirati entity like a national state with its own legitimate interests that can even collide with pan-Islamic values and, history, uh, and interests. And they legitimize the Emirati lifestyles, which is a very Western-oriented lifestyle. So, uh, for example, very recently, the Emirati have modified their legislation in order to allow non-married couples to live together. Why? This is not intended for the nationals, of course, 
but for those expatriates who live in the countries and are key to the Emirati uh, economic success. So on the one hand, in the Turkish case, we have a, what we can legitimate, legitimately call a populist Islamist discourse based on nostalgia for the past, fueling a sense of victimhood, a victimhood mentality, and accompanying an anti-Kemalist and anti-Western resentment. And this discourse is meant to mobilize Muslims around the world on the base of uh, a sense of Muslim pride and solidarity. On the other hand, a, a rhetoric centered on tolerance, which is directed at a Western audience and resonates very strongly uh, in Western, we can say security focus circles. Uh, there are some instances where the clash between these two visions, these two worldviews is very uh, visible. And I have uh, selected three instances in particular. The first one is the political use of places of worship. Uh, some months ago, international uh, audience was the international audience attention uh, was captured by Erdogan's decision to reconvert the Hagia Sophia mosque into which was a museum into a mosque in an actual mosque this is a decision that dates back to Erdogan's political formative years when he was the mayor of Istanbul and this is an initiative that served to stress, to communicate the independence of Turkey from the West, Turkey's sovereignty and its ability to stand up to the West while other Muslim countries were renouncing their role to defend uh, Islam. So, with this reconversion, uh, Erdogan tried to boost his image and his credentials as a, an Islamic uh, leader. On the, other, on the other hand, we have the building in Abu Dhabi of the so-called Abrahamic family house, which is a compound uh, made of uh, three religious spaces, one in front of the others, a mosque, a synagogue, and a church, uh, sharing a common uh, space and designed uh, at representing this harmony, this unity between the different uh, religious communities living together. It is a very, you can say, artificial space because we don't even know uh, what communities they will uh, serve because, and they, there are some questions about this space, these spaces. For example, uh, there will be a church, but for which Christian community, for, for uh, uh, the Catholic, Latin Catholic church or uh, for Eastern churches, we don't know. There is a mosque, but is it for uh, uh, Sunni Muslims or is it for Shia Muslim? We don't know. So this is a very symbolic place, but it is it represents the very opposite of Erdogan's idea of uh, an Islamic, an exclusive Islamic identity. The second instance is the stance Turkish, Turkish and Emirati stance toward Israel. As we know, Erdogan's uh, tends to present himself as the um, uh, tend to present Turkey as a country that is particularly interested in the defense of Palestinian rights. 
And when Erdogan reconverted uh, the mosque, uh, Hagia Sophia, uh, he framed this uh, initiative as a prelude to the uh, liberation of Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. On the other, on the other hand, we have the normalization between uh, the United Arab Emirates and Israel, uh, according uh, on account of this Abraham Accord. So uh, once again, we have this mobilization of religion, of a religious tradition, uh, for political purposes. The third uh, case. Uh, representing this um, two diametrically opposed stances is represented by the French, the stance towards the French debate on Islam. Erdogan is riding the Muslims' anger toward the publication of the uh, satirical uh, characters of uh, the Islamic, the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad. And on, on the other hand, you have uh, Emirati leadership expressing their solidarity with France. Uh, an Emirati minister uh, declared that we have to listen to what Macron in his speech really said. He does not want the isolation of Muslims in the West and he is absolutely right. So this mm, desire to, to cooperate with the West and to support Western uh, countries and Western leadership in their initiative, even as far as Islam is concerned. So there are some reasons accounting for these uh, radical differences, and they are relevant, I think they are relevant for our discussion on populism. For example, a fir the first reason I think is that uh, Erdogan Although, uh, even in spite of his uh, authoritarian uh, drifts, uh, is still uh, accountable to a people. Uh, in Turkey, there are uh, 80 million inhabitants, 80 million peoples. So for Erdogan, mobilizing Islam is a tool for, um, for uh, addressing his constituency, therefore gaining, uh, for having electoral results. In the case of the United Arab Emirates, we do not have a proper uh, people, we have a population which consists of um, around 2 million uh, nationals and 8 million immigrants. So the Emirati leadership is not uh, accountable for uh, their decision. Uh, their discourse is uh, directed exclusively at the West, at Western powers. And it is just a way of exerting uh, a soft power framed in terms of uh, Islam. The second reason accounting for these differences is relationship with history and the past. Turkey is a very deep rooted Islamic past. Uh, the Hagia Sophia case demonstrates this very well. Uh, the Emirates are, are a very young country uh, which was created in the in the 70s and they are projected towards the future so their political narrative reflects this hope in the future and this we could say this freedom from past uh, values from past narratives uh, and from past history but uh, I, even if the, we have to take these characteristics into account, uh, I think they do not uh, account completely for these radical differences. For example, there, there's another country which shares some characteristics with the United Arab Emirates, uh, and I'm referring to the Qatar, 
that is proposing a very different language, which is much more akin to uh, Turkey uh, preference for uh, Islamism. And after this uh, overview, I would like to stress two final remarks. The first one is that um, neither of these two discourses is conducive to democracy because the Turkish model and the Turkish discourse is centered on Islamic identity and it is intended to not just to mobilize people but to, polar, to polarize people and positions. I think it is a sort of deep politicization, depoliticization of, um, uh, of the people, uh, of politics, but on the base of an ideological affiliation. Erdogan is trying to boosting and to bolster the uh, Islamic dimension, not just of the Turkish people, but of Muslims around the world. Uh, while the Emirati discourse is intended to, to provide stability, and it is another way of uh, neutralizing, it's a way of neutralizing Islam as a political element, it stress the need to maintain stability and to foster authoritarian rule against uh, democracy. So the first remark is the relationship with uh, democracy. The second remark uh, is about the use of Islam in politics. Uh, I think it is interesting to notice that both countries for different, very different reasons and for very different political purposes uh, use Islamic language. Uh, contrary to what happened in the past, for example, in the past when, when Turkey represented a uh, um, Muslim majority country, but very integrate into the Western model, very uh, a country that uh, wished to be a friend of the West, they did so with a secular language. They stressed their secular um, system and they stressed their secular model. Uh, the United Arab Emirates are pursuing a similar objective they want to be integrated, they want to be identified with the West, but they do so by resorting to an Islamic language. And I think this confirmed uh, Huntington's ob observation about the role of religion in international uh, relations. And I think this is very important as far as, as the uh, challenges to the Westphalian models are concerned. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you so much for that truly stimulating <clears throat> presentation on these two uh, hugely important countries in, in the area that you are describing. Um, we can take a moment for, um, for discussion uh, before moving on to our next presenter. And I would, I would just start with one question, which is um, whether or not there's, uh, well, to agree with you that um, the Erdogan regime and the AKP rule is not a great um, advertisement for the union, if you like, of Islamism or Islam and democracy. But I would argue that that's not necessarily for uh, Islamic reasons. Um, it's repressive 
in other ways that the Turkish Republic has been repressive towards its opposition. Um, and so out of fairness to the, the, the Turkish government, um, there, are, there, are, there are ways in which there was a necessary correction that would have to take place for Turkey to truly democratize, which is to say to grant certain relatively elementary basic freedoms of religion to the vast majority of its citizens. And so the reason why Turkey only has Muslims right now effectively is not because Turkey chose to only have Muslims. Turkey's territory got reduced by European liberation and occupation over centuries, leaving it only with Muslims left. <laughs> now that puts it in an awkward situation when it comes to realizing its own identity as a democracy. And so I just wonder whether you might comment on, on the, the, the difficulties that any Turkish government might face in correcting some of the excesses of the, of the previous century. Yes, of course, there is a-, a, Professor, a La, did, Professor Adi, excuse me, did Lahwari Adi, did you want to add something? I, I uh, let him answer to your question. Okay. I would like to make some comments okay. about what he said. It was very interesting. Okay, pardon me for the interruption. Um, go ahead. I agree that there is a corrective dimension in the rise of, of uh, the AKP and Erdogan. It, indeed, it is not a novelty of the, of the new millennium, but this started in we can say starting in the 50s and gained momentum after the 80s. Uh, of course, there was a, a, a very uh, big, there were very big sectors of, the, of Turkish society that needed to be represented in politics. They had no representation, neither in politics nor in the economy, for example. And the AKP allowed the emergence of these of an Islamic uh, civil society this, th that was not re represented, um, and so the the problems he he had to address predate uh, his rise to power, and in some way he inherited the flaws of the Kemalist even the authoritarianism of the Kemalist model. They are just, they are specular, I, I would say. The problem is that uh, some observers in the, in the, in the, until the, I would say 2010, many observers were hoping for a, as I said in my speech, a post-secular Turkey. This is a, a country where uh, religious people and secular people could cooperate to frame a new shared discourse and to and on the basis of shared values. And the uh, the role played by Hagia Sophia. Museum Mosque was crucial in this in this sense because starting after the AKP uh, arrived to power, many many people started to talk of uh, uh, of modifying the status of the museum, but to to allow, for example, the presence of different uh, religious communities in this place of worship to allow for the performing of different kinds of worship. And right. this would, would have um, meant, this would have uh, ushered in a, a really post-secular phase. But uh, let's say that Erdogan and the AKP chose a different, a different, a very different path. They just reversed the authoritarianism of the Kemalist rule into an Islamist authoritarianism. <laughs> yes. Now, I, I wonder whether they might not reply that they're still waiting for the Grand Mosque of Athens to be constructed. 
But uh, <laughs> Professor Lahwari Adi, uh, go, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Bignori. It's a very interesting uh, uh, expose about uh, Turkey and uh, the, the Emirate uh, United Arab. Uh, uh, very interesting and uh, with uh, insight that uh, push to further uh, thinking and uh, discussion. So I would like, I don't have a question, but I would like just to, to, to comment, to add to your, uh, uh, what you said. Uh, the, the first thing, and I, uh, of course, I agree with you, you, you underline that the differences between the two countries are basically political and not religious. The, the motivation of uh, Erdogan and of the Emirates, they are political. The, the, the Turkey would like to ascertain itself as a regional power in, uh, in the Middle East, and uh, the Emirates are uh, uh, motivated by their fear uh, towards Iran. So they need the support of uh, the, 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 the religious approach in uh, both countries, and especially in the Emirates, uh, are not, are not uh, how can I say, are not deep. Because this, uh, the, if we think about uh, Turkey, why, why after the Kemalist experience, the Islamists came back with strength? It's because, we like it or not, because uh, the Kemalist experience failed. And uh, why it failed? It failed because uh, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk didn't implement the reform of, the, of theology. We, we, we need to remember that modernity in Europe started with reform of uh, theology. And it's important because, because theology, it's still in the Muslim world, the source of cultural representation that uh, indicate what is good, what is bad, what is uh, politically right, what is uh, politically wrong, and even what is uh, legitimate or illicit and illicit. So the reform of theology is, uh, is, is, is uh, indispensable for, for the process of uh, moderniza modernization. And I would like to, to underline that the, there was an attempt of reform of theology in, uh, in Islam with the Mahda, with Muhammad Abdu, but it failed. So Ataturk didn't reform the, 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 the Muslim theology. And I would like to add that there are, we can, we can uh, discuss about it. I think, I think there are two characteristic uh, of modernity. The first one, modernity made the state power public and it made religion private. So uh, neither in the Emirates or in Turkey, uh, the religion is uh, private. The state power is public in Turkey. It's not public in the Emirates. And the, 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 the Emirates, they are just accommodating Wahhabism to the international uh, uh, environment and just to, 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 to get support from the international, uh, for, for Western countries. And it is the reform they are implementing are artificial. And if, if there is a coup and it is a possibility because it is not a democratic country. If there is a coup, all this policy of uh, uh, accommodation of the West and, and uh, relationship with Israel and so on and so will be reversed, will be reversed. So 
I don't think that the Emirates are on the way of uh, modernization or uh, modernity. And about the, the, the conflict of the issue. I'm so sorry, Professor. Uh, I, I need to interrupt you in order to give you the okay. floor. Okay. <laughs> okay, I, I stop you. And uh, you are you are you are next in line to speak, and so mm -hmm. I thought I should rather introduce you and then let you continue because what you're saying is is fascinating. I don't want to uh, interrupt your train of thought, but it it helps just for the flow of our session to give you your uh, time now, so then we can have a few minutes at the end for the common discussion. So okay. if you just allow me to to introduce you, Professor Lahari uh, Adi is a sociologist and political scientist who received his doctorate from the Ecole des Hautes Etudes en Sciences Sociales uh, in Paris. He has been a professor of sociology at the Université d'Oran Oran in Algeria and also in Sciences Po Lyon and at the University of Lyon where he remains an emeritus professor. Uh, he has uh, lived in the United States as well uh, as an associate researcher at Georgetown University and uh, he is well known for his work on uh, Tunisian politics and on Islamism and on the transition to democracy uh, more generally. His recent uh, uh, publications include uh, The Crisis of Muslim Religious Discourse, The Necessary Passage from Plato to Kant, that was published uh, last year in 2019. And he has a number of other uh, very interesting uh, uh, publications as well. Uh, and with that, I turn the floor uh, back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Lawrence. And uh, thank you for the organizer of this uh, seminar for the, inv for the invitation. And I found that the subject is very uh, re relevant. Uh, since we are uh, witnessing uh, a, a rise of uh, populism uh, in Europe. I will, I will uh, focus on Algeria, where uh, I implemented uh, for many years uh, fieldwork. And uh, I won't say that in Algeria there is a rise of uh, uh, populism, since uh, it was there uh, with the birth of a uh, nation state. It's uh, from the beginning. So populism uh, is, is, is a, a blueprint of, uh, of uh, the political culture of uh, Algerian elites and uh, it marks the political field. It's, in, it's uh, inherited from uh, the liberation war against the French uh, colonial uh, uh, domination. So it's, it's, uh, it's a legacy of a national, uh, nationalist movement that had to, to forge, to coin an image of a people united against uh, the foreign uh, domination. Uh, it was embodied by uh, the, the FLN, the Front de Libération Nationale, the FLN party that ruled the, the state since uh, independence. Uh, Algeria was uh, for uh, almost uh, 30 years until uh, uh, 1989, uh, a single party uh, system. And after riots that occurred nationwide in uh, 1988, the, the single party system uh, was uh, suppressed and there was a, a multi-partism. And uh, in the favor of multi-partism, uh, populist po uh, Islamist parties raised. And three years after uh, the experience of multipartism, that uh, led to the victory, uh, the electoral victory of uh, the main uh, uh, Islamist party. So uh, the military canceled the results. And for 10 years, there was a civil war or, or, or a war between uh, the Islamists, uh, armed groups, and uh, the military. So democracy, or at least the electoral democracy, lasted just uh, three years in uh, Algeria, and the the former the former uh, ruling party uh, was winning, uh, and is still uh, winning the election, but uh, tricked elections. So basically, the ideology of the ruling party, the FLN. Uh, 
uh, that stems from the war liberation is is a uh, uh, is a mix is a mix of uh, nationalist rhetoric and anti-capitalism uh, feeling or anti-capitalism stance. Uh, I would I wouldn't say that the regime was a socialist. I would say that after independence the regime was rather anti-capitalistic. This, this, uh, this opposition to capitalism has uh, many sources. The first one uh, resides in the ideological beliefs of, of, of the Algerian uh, nationalist elite that uh, Colonialism in Algeria was a byproduct of French capitalism. So the, 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 the national elites equates, equates uh, uh, colonialism that Algeria suffered from to capitalism. So there is, for this uh, reason, a rejection of capitalism. The second reason is that capitalism means the market and its inequalities. So uh, it is assumed that the market deepens the, divi the division within society, within the people, and harms the cohesion, the unity of the people. And uh, the, the nationalistic ideology, the Algerian nationalistic ideology rests, rests on the unity of the people. And from this unity uh, stems the idea of one party. One party represents the people. The third reason is that capitalism helps the rich to get over the state through electoral process. Uh, yet the, 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 the for, for, for the populist uh, ideology, the core of the people are the poor, not the rich. The, 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 the core, the, the poor represent the best values of the country, of the tradition of the, of the people. So uh, the idea that the rich gain power uh, by election, and uh, rule the state is at odds with Algerian, uh, with Algerian populism. So from the outset, the Algerian regime was uh, against uh, capitalism and it built uh, not a, a socialist economy, but a state-run economy to prevent the accumulation of wealth on the basis of uh, private ownership. The, the, the idea uh, is that uh, the Algerian people are, are united and they shouldn't be divided economically. The, this discourse met the expectations of uh, the population, uh, I would say until now. And it's the root of, uh, of, uh, of uh, populism. Populism is not uh, an emanation of uh, the ruling elite. It's it's uh, its source. It's it's uh, society, but society in in historical conditions. Even though populism is declining, it's still it's still uh, uh, strong. And ironically, uh, the 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 failure of the regime that is populist. Uh, didn't mean, didn't, didn't, uh, wasn't followed by the, the, the decline of uh, populism. So the, the failure of the Algerian regime and the, the loss of its uh, popular support, because he, he, he used to have a popular support in the 60s and 70s, but he, it lost this support 
but populism migrated to the opposition. So uh, the, 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 the ideological strength of a regime based on populism declined, but ironically, populism didn't disappear. It is today uh, expressed by the Islamist opposition. And the Islamist opposition uh, accuses the leaders to have betrayed the nationalist ideology inherited from the, 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 the liberation war. So uh, one of the, of the characteristic of Algerian Islamism is that it claims to represent all the people, to represent the people with, with the exception of individuals influenced by the, uh, the, the Western values. So uh, there is no need in, in this in this uh, in this uh, ideology, and if it is uh, claimed by the, major, the, the majority, there is no need for democracy. If 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 democracy means electoral alternation, uh, and since there is no uh, division in the body politics. The democracy is not needed. It's not necessary. We need just one good, one good uh, party, and this party is the Islamist party that would represent all all uh, the people. So they 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 uh, in the seventies, uh, I would say in the eighties and nineties, the Islamists they accepted the electoral democracy, but to to take place just once just once and, li and later there won't be a need for uh, election. I would say that this discourse uh, changed today. It's not uh, because we need to take into account history. If not, uh, we, we, we fail in essentialism because even the Islamists are changing or their discourse is is it changing now they claim the islamists claim that they are favorable to democracy and they they accept the idea of multipartism however they consider that they represent the majority of the people i, I think that uh, in its essence religion or at least the monotheist uh, religions uh, is 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 populist by by definition, since uh, it claims uh, it claims to gather all the people on the basis of uh, uh, moral values. So the Islamists claim that they speak on behalf of the people, especially the poor. In their discourse, all men are equal, no matter their their wealth. Islam doesn't acknowledge the class struggle uh, or, or, or the division of society on the, uh, on the economic basis. The, the Islamists, they have followers among poor people, but also uh, among uh, wealthy uh, people, wealthy uh, merchants. However, I, I don't think that uh, religion in itself is an obstacle to uh, democracy. Populism, either religious or secular or secular or secularized, is an obstacle to democracy to the extent that democracy rests on the idea that society is divided. There are different interests uh, in 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 in, uh, in uh, society. From, from this division, different political ideologies or political currents emerge and compete to take over the state uh, through an electoral process. The second condition of democracy is that the different political currents in competition have the, the same chance to win the election. If, if if a political current is stronger or more popular for decades 
democracy is in danger or it's not possible. It's, it's the case of Turkey, uh, where Recep Erdogan won the election many times on the road. He became an autocrat elected in a, in a democratic uh, framework. Uh, basically, in the long run, uh, democracy and populism are at odds. They are incompatible. It's not, it's not enough to gain, uh, to gain the popular vote to enhance democracy. The, the ideological basis of democracy is, is the right to civic liberties that, that uh, uh, citizens enjoy, by citizens enjoy. Meaning that uh, democracy aims to protect the individual, uh, while populism aims to protect the group, or, or rather a group with an imagined, imagined unity. So more importantly, more impo importantly, populism denies that there are political divergences in society, while democracy is the framework in which the political uh, and ideological divergences are accommodated. So I would conclude that uh, we need to take into account history because the actors of history uh, change and evolve. I think that, and it will be my conclusion, uh, the Islamist party will become through time, conservative parties, as, as, uh, as we witnessed it uh, in uh, Northern uh, European countries with uh, the called the so-called party uh, Christian Democrats or Social Democrats. I think that we are uh, leading toward this, uh, this situation and they won't be anymore an obstacle to democracy, they will be a branch of the political field, the conservative one. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Professor. That was really interesting and it built very nicely on, on the previous presentation. Um, so I would like to uh, in, invite um, the attendees to submit questions uh, for any of the panelists, but the first one uh, comes from uh, Mariam Sawan, uh, and uh, we can let um, Professor Lahwari Adi respond. It regards the relationship between religion and politics and the example of Lebanon as a parliamentary democratic republic, which has an overall framework of confessionalism, but it also has a form of consociationalism, as you know, whereby the highest offices are reserved for certain religious communities. Do you think that this effort of giving each religion a space has been successful? Is sectarianism the solution to the conflict between religion and politics? Will this type of democracy last or collapse? Until uh, recently, uh, I would say until the civil war in Lebanon, Lebanon was the only Arab country with a, a democracy. I would say that democracy in, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, Lebanon showed its limits because of this uh, fragile balance of power of different religious communities. Uh, it was a beginning, but uh, it, 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 it reached its limits. And I think that uh, the Arab countries in the environment, and even Israel, played a role to, uh, to harm uh, a democratic uh, Lebanon. So democracy depends, of course, on the structure or the, the, the local structure of society, but also when uh, the country is, uh, is small, 
but also the geopolitical stakes. So Syria, the, re the Syrian regime at the time of Hafez al-Assad didn't want Lebanon to be a democratic country. And Israel didn't want to be uh, uh, Lebanon to be a democratic country. Right. Thank you very much. It's a very, it's a very interesting answer. Um, I'm going to go to Professor Alessandro Ferrari to pose his question. Thank you. Thank you. It's a question for all the panelists. Uh, I'm wondering what is the role uh, of the Westphalian secular Europe in relation to the religious uh, political parties in the southern shore, because Erdogan just arrived after two decisions of the Strasbourg court against uh, a religious Hermakan uh, political party. Uh, Algeria, uh, Europe was very concerned. It seems to prefer a military regime than uh, a religious one. And in Egypt, uh, also the presidency, the Morsi presidency was more feared than the El Sisi one. And so uh, we have in many constitutions uh, articles that forbid the, the formation of religious political parties, although they are interpreted in different ways. So uh, what is the role that uh, Westphalian Europe and secular Europe can play in relation to the democratic bargaining in the southern shore? And also, uh, the, uh, has been Tunisia another time an exceptional case because in relation to another Europe seemed to have had uh, a different uh, perception uh, instead of other religious political parties. Thank you. Thank you. So this is a, 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 an issue. I, I imagine each of the panelists will have something to say. So we will, we can we can turn to you in turn. But if Professor Adi would like to uh, begin, then we can go to. Uh, yeah, I, I, ideally, ideally, uh, the the Europe uh, should uh, uh, support uh, the democratic process in uh, the Arab world and. Uh, uh, help the democratic uh, forces to 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 uh, to establish uh, democracy. However, however, um, it doesn't work like that in in uh, political uh, in international relations. The Europe Europe has its own interests, and Europe fears fears the instability. Even if it is in an, an instability of two or three or four years, this instability could unleash uh, a clandestine immigration toward Europe. So Europe uh, is, is motivated by uh, its uh, immediate interests, even though the, 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 the long run interest uh, is a democracy, is democracy. And in Egypt, for, for, for instance, it's, it's, it's more difficult than in Algeria or Morocco to, uh, to have a, a democratic uh, uh, state because, because the public opinion in Egypt is in majority against the relationship, the diplomatic relationship with Israel. So Israel doesn't want a democracy in Egypt, so Europe and, and the United States. So it's, it's a complicated, there are, there are, uh, aspects, uh, uh, international uh, aspects, geopolitical. While in Tunisia, in Tunisia, it is uh, underway, and it's possible that it will su succeed uh, in Tunisia. Thank you very much, Michele um, Brignone. Uh, if you would also like to add your response to the question in the chat regarding how the UAE is seen by conservative countries, and then we will turn to Professor Sorice. Yes, indeed, the European Union played a crucial role in helping Erdogan to get rid of the Kemalist elite and marginalizing the Turkish military. And this was a very important phase in the rise of, in the consolidation of the power of the AKP because they played the democratization and the process of uh, entering the European, uh, being a candidate for the European Union to marginalize the uh, the military 
uh, apart from this um, historical experience, uh, of course, I agree that uh, European countries, both European countries and the European Union should support the process, democratization process and the evolution of um, Islamist party or um, Islam inspired parties. But if, if we adopt a, a realist uh, view and a realist stance, we have to, uh, we cannot but observe that uh, in, in this moment, European countries are very much focused and I would say even obsessed by security issues. Yeah, that's right. As, as Professor Adi said, they, they don't want instability. And after, mm -hmm. after the consequences of the Arab Spring, I think that in the short run, uh, the support of, democrat, of democratic change will be very unlikely. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, let me turn now to Professor Michele Sorice. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I'm not a specialist of, uh, of a specific question concerning religion, and um, but uh, uh, I, I want to ask uh, uh, on some two points in particular. The first one is the concept of sectarianism that has been used also in the past. The Roman Empire was based upon sectarianism and the use of different religious appeals in his, its organization. Um, I think that, uh, anyway, when we speak about populism, uh, we should avoid the, uh, uh, and I, I, in, this, in, this, uh, in this regard, I fully agree uh, with the position at the, uh, that the professor of the positions on this topic, um, I, I think that religion and populism are two different things. Uh, in my opinion, usually re religion is used by politicians. Uh, um, we have a lot of examples of, also in Europe uh, and it's uh, very common for European people to see some examples of thin centered ideology like the right wing populism, uh, which uh, with which usually it's homogeneous people against a set of elite and dangerous others, and the others are depicted as uh, depriving of uh, religious uh, values and so on. So the populist use of religion usually is concerned the belonging and non the, and not the belief. The uh, and usually it revolves around to the two main notions of restoration and battles as you, you, you know better than me. So mm, the restorationist discourse uh, in, is usually based on a, a specific as a set of codes that is a very different from the sociological uh, concept of culture. And it, it is a reproposition of the logic of us versus them at the point that the restoration is usually accompanied by the idea of an essential battle to defend local spaces from alien religions and to keep native religious symbols in public spaces. But it happens also in Italy, think about uh, Mr. Salvini's use of religion, for example, uh, many other uh, populist right-wing uh, parties across Europe using religious symbols. But I think that religious is uh, as really nothing to share with the populism. Um, populism uses a lot of symbols and a lot of codes, and among these also religion, but is a instrumental use of religion, in my opinion. Um, and uh, this is the same for, for Christian faith, for Islam religion, for, but it is the same also for many other religions. Uh, it's possible to use a lot of religious appeals, but at the same time as we can use also the food as a nationalist tool 
think about a usual stereotype. In, in, in Italy, for example, a typical everyday stereotype is, oh, my neighbor uh, is a good person, but um, his, uh, his or her food is stinky. Uh, I don't understand how they can eat some terrible things. Um, that is a, 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 a simple and everyday life tool to affirm a rational, a, um, nationalist and racist position, even if they don't declare it themselves as racist. So at the same time, religious symbols are used in the same in the same way, but only for political goals, and they have nothing to share with uh, uh, with religious uh, aspects. In my opinion, that's a very interesting point. Uh, yes, please, Professor Adi. Yeah, I, I agree to some extent, uh, uh, and the difference should be uh, made in this way. Uh, but populism can't take over of religion, since uh, religion in itself, in itself, uh, I almost uh, would say uh, doesn't exist. What exists is religion for oneself. So there are many interpretations. There are interpretations of religion through history and uh, through uh, social groups. So uh, populism uh, take over religion. It's not, uh, it's not religion that is populist uh, per, per se, but populism could be religious. It's, it's what I wanted to underline. Yes, no, that's a very interesting point. And, and what you're both saying reminds me of, of course, the current controversy in France, which includes not just a discussion of the appropriateness of religious caricature, but uh, the appropriateness of community identification precisely with food. Items like, uh, you know, having an aisle in your supermarket for the, 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 the food products that are religiously approved for a certain religious diet or not, um, that is used even at the ministerial level as, as proof of, a, of, a, of an unwillingness to integrate. So that, that sort of populism doesn't only um, exist you know, in, in sort of popular neighborhoods, but it is indeed perpetuated to a certain extent by political forces who stand to, to benefit from, uh, from their own apparent toughness uh, to ward off what they assure us are even worse populists to their right, uh, no doubt. Uh, so it's with this uh, uh, final uh, conversation that we uh, must bring our panel to an end. Um, but I'd like to thank all three panelists, of course, um, Professor Michele Sorice, uh, Dr. Michele Brignone, and Professor Lahwari Addi. Uh, you were all uh, really a, a pleasure to listen to, and, and I've learned a lot from each of you, so, so thank you. And, and of course, I also recognize our hosts, uh, Professor Alessandro Ferrari and uh, Confronti. Um, and and uh, thank you all for being here. I hope I hope that we can uh, see each other uh, some other time, uh, maybe other, maybe even live and in person uh, yeah. in, in a future world. So um, thank you all, inshallah, next year in Jerusalem and all the rest. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.